Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, conference organizers for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our new operation, uh, First, First Base Pharmaceuticals is the way it's pronounced. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little about a new approach to ALS drug development that is really an old approach, um, a tried and tested approach. It's designing small molecules to correct dysfunction in metabolic regulation. Now, Dan was originally scheduled to give this presentation. Um, this is all from the seminal work, the blockbuster work of Dan Kaganovich. Um, I'm privileged to be able to uh, give the presentation today in the hope of putting a little bit of a uh, more global uh, spin on things. Now I have lost control. All right, there it goes. Um, yes, I have control. Yeah, a, a little bit of a uh, broad uh, perspective on, on the problem. Um, my talk is going to uh, follow the same title, but it'll have a section on basically wiping the slate clean and talking about how one would choose the best therapeutic paradigm or modality. Then there will be a short section where I really try to very quickly review some of the data that uh, the Kaganovich lab um, accrued over the years, and in particular, very recently, that really turns uh, our, uh, the understanding of stress granule function on its head. And then finally, pulling threads together, talk about how this affects a new disease interpretation and a new therapeutic strategy. So starting with the therapeutic paradigm, and I apologize for the fact that you'll all be saying, yeah, well, we all know this. Yes, we, most of us do. Um, the, uh, the big question with ALS is, of course, what causes it? Um, if you look at the uh, right-hand side of the screen here is just a sampling of the pathophysiology that uh, characterizes ALS. And towards the top, there are obviously the debilitating uh, loss of functions that really characterize it in a clinical sense. And then underline, uh, underneath that, there's just a sampling of some of the more molecular level and cellular level aberrations that uh, are involved in, in, in ALS. And uh, these, if you like, are more likely to represent causative factors than the true macroscopic physiology. But all of this sort of states the current dilemma of the whole field, and that can be summed up in the phrase at the bottom here, what's cause and what is effect? That really uh, underscores just about everything we do in this field. Now, as you know, a correlation, a high correlation with a medical diagnosis is not sufficient. And usually you're looking for some sort of a temporal evolution that is a signature of the progression of biochemical events that can be traced back to give a cause. Now, fortunately, because of the fantastic work of uh, many uh, investigators, we've started to make uh, build some uh, solid footholds in this regard. And it's through understanding ALS familial mutations. Now, uh, going back to yesterday's presentation, I don't, I apologize if I've got the wrong jargon here, but I mean familial or um, uh, germline mutations, inherited mutations, that although they may be monogenic, through a series of events, cause a deltering or a, an explosion of uh, pathophysiology at the end game. And this pattern of pathophysiology is obviously um, somewhat variable. Um, it's mosaic. There are variations on the theme depending on what the instigating factors are, but it's close enough to a similar package of pathophysiology that it's um, representative of all ALS patients. And the chain of events suggests that somewhere in here, there is a domino effect that is blowing out in all sorts of biology. Now, if we 
look back and say, okay, well, these familial mutations affect a lot of diverse mechanisms, then you can sort of infer at the other end of the upstream end that there is a convergence of mechanisms because these are not necessarily related proteins. They have commonalities, but there's a convergence followed by an exploding divergence of biology here. Now, that's the simplest state. In addition, we all know that there are sporadic drivers, risk factors, that represents a whole new, less known realm of ALS. And uh, we heard yesterday some epigenetic phenomena, somatic gene disruptions are possible, and then patient physiological status, environmental factors, all sorts of things can contribute here. And it's still pretty cloudy as to what the causes and effects are here, but it's got to be applied to the simpler uh, landscape of the primal causes, the genetic mutations. Now, let's start talking about the varieties of fixes we can apply to this. There's a lot of talk recently about um, genetic fixes. Now, these are fantastically interesting because they go furthest upstream, they address the root cause potentially, and they offer new therapeutic modalities that can be applied to this problem. But the cons of this approach is that they can overlook other risk factors. More specifically, the therapeutic methodology, despite huge advances, is still in its infancy compared to small molecule drug discovery. And it, there do remain risks with genetic therapies. But even if you get all of this right, factor in the other, uh, the other risk factors and get, get a safe approach, this may treat only small population niches at a time. Uh, some of the larger uh, familial mutations are still only a relatively small percent of ALS patients. And uh, the whole um, package really may only account for about 80% or thereabouts of ALS patients. So it may require one at a time fixes and it does not cover sporadic cases. If we now think about possible pharmacological fixes, well, on the left, we can go far upstream and try and find something that hits all of the genetic uh, variants of ALS. And the bottom line here is we don't know how to do that. There's a lot of emerging uh, science that is fantastic but we still have insufficient mechanistic understanding on how to do that. And it still may require one genetic subpopulation fixed at a time. If we go down to the biology of ALS, then my argument is, well, we're too late and too late for two different reasons. First, that this is generally focusing way downstream. It may be that the genetic and other uh, precipitants of ALS have already done their damage and it is just mechanistically too late. But generally speaking, this is more likely to give you ameliorative therapies rather than curative. And the other dimension of being too late is we've been trying this for decades and we've really not solved the problem of ALS. So we'd argue that the optimal fix is to look for a causal nexus where the divergence of these known mechanisms seems to occur, where it may be intersecting with sporadic drivers and before it blows out to create this systemic meltdown and diverse pathophysiology. And we call this the search for a causal nexus or convergence of causes. So that's our underlying view of this. And I'm going to move on to quickly review some of the data from the Kaganovich lab. And we'll start with what preceded that. And that is this observation that many of these causative mutations map in one way or another to stress granules. Now, stress granules have a spectrum of opinions in terms of what they are. Um, many of these proteins are insinuated as poisoning stress granules or uh, infecting them. Um, 
other end of the spectrum is they just finish up in this toxic waste dump. And this spectrum of opinions essentially ha has stress granules being at one end a toxic cellular junk pile, at the other end a vital regulatory system. Now, I don't mean to choose sides on cause uh, on um, gain of function versus loss of function mutation effects. But this is in the absence of a an understanding, a true understanding of what stress granules do. And that introduces the work of Dan Kaganovich's lab. And I refer to this landmark paper. I'm going to quickly go through some of the observations in it. First and foremost, they observed that healthy stress granules physically interact with mitochondria and that deep characterization of this interaction shows a vital and direct physical uh, uh, vital and direct regulatory effect. This summarizes most of the key data. If we start off by saying neurons generally in a healthy state need energy at call, that usually takes the form of glycolysis or small molecules that can be rapidly mobilized and pump out ATP. But when they're stressed or starved, they tend to turn on fatty acid oxidation. Now, fatty acid oxidation is great, yields a lot of ATP, but it churns out a lot of ugly uh, uh, chemistry as well, reactive oxygen uh, species and what have you. And the requirement is that cells need to shut this uh, increase of fatty acid oxidation down almost as soon as it occurs. And this has a consequence of redirecting lipids shown in this panel to storage depots, lipid, uh, lipid vesicles. And all of this coincides the fatty acid oxidation increase and decrease and the lipid depoting occurs concurrently with a development of healthy stress granules. And what this does is it avoids buildup of toxic fatty acid products. It reduces redox stress, preserves lipids, and keeps the whole metabolic system in check. But this paper goes so deep, it's a treasure trove of science, and I'm not, I don't have time to go through all of it, but other uh, pivotal findings are that these, uh, this turning off of fatty acid uh, oxidation requires functional stress granules, that genetic intervention to introduce an ALS uh, TDP43 mutant fails to turn off the stress, uh, the fatty acid oxidation after stress, and that these mutant cells that fail to arrest fatty acid oxidation happen to have aberrant stress granules. And all of this, this system, yet these cells are chock full of ATP and as a consequence, reactive oxygen species. Now, I don't have time to go all of those uh, through all of those data. Read the paper. As I said, it's a treasure trove. I'm going to touch on two elements in a little more detail. First, that this phenotype has been confirmed in ALS patient derived neurons. Taking IPS cells and taking down, them down a trajectory to neurons, we'd see the same regulatory control of fatty acid oxidation, where normally turns on the emergency energy system and then turns it off. But these ALS mutants fail to regain control of the fatty acid oxidation after the acute stress. They also, though the data are not shown here, fail to elicit normal stress granule development and they fail to form the same lipid droplet depoting clusters that I referred to before. The other uh, finding that I want to add a little more depth to is the one target that was identified as central in all of this is a VDAC voltage dependent ion channel. These are beta barrel porins and just look at the structure on the left. This looks like it is a flow valve and that's what it does. It is the main conduit for import of lipids into mitochondria. And this makes complete sense of the biology that is explained in this paper. Now, there are multiple complex mechanistic partners and control features of this protein that I don't have time to go into. Um, 
this is one example of something that we can exploit a regulatory flow valve, if you wish, that we can exploit to regulate lipid import into the mitochondrial matrix uh, or into the mitochondria and uh, thus achieve our therapeutic objective. So sorry I went, went through those results so quickly, go to the papers and uh, absorb some more, but now to wrap it together in our new disease interpretation and the therapeutic strategy. So healthy stress granules from all of this work, we argue ration lipid influx into mitochondria. And this is a hitherto unknown function of stress granules. And it's done by intimate relationships. On the bottom, you see a cartoon of this. It's akin to a thermostat. When there is no stress on the left here, most of the time the cells operate with normal glycolysis. But in times of temporal stress and starvation, they tend to burn fatty acids as a backup source of energy only. And they do it briefly through the combustion chamber being the mitochondria. And in this scenario, these lipid droplets are the depots or fuel tanks. Now, in ALS, things go terribly, terribly wrong. Oops. The biology here is essentially described. The stress granules fail to turn off the fatty acid oxidation after stress. This burns lipids need needlessly. It depletes the lipid pools and it causes toxic accumulation of fatty acid oxidation products, reactive oxygen species. And all of this sends the ALS neurons into a metabolic death spiral. Now, if we go to our cartoons, it's described we've got a broken thermostat. The regulatory system is corrupt by these mutations. The result is the backup energy system is just out of control. It's pumping out reactive oxygen species and other uh, feedback inhibitors. The combustion chamber, the mitochondria are out of control and all representing some lethal biology for ALS patients. And on the other side, it depletes and wastes the vital lipid resources that are needed for other cellular functions. So going back to our cartoon, the basis for all of this at the beginning, our therapeutic strategy, as we said, there's the problem. We've got a broken thermostat, a convergence of biology from the familial muta mutations to the pathophysiology and our solution. I'm sorry if I've got things flashing in front of us. The um, using small molecule drugs to stop the direct consequences, which is really this sort of cellular and molecular level uh, aberrations that are here. And we believe that that in turn is going to limit the unpleasant sequ sequelae that lead to the physiological macroscopic problems and other underlying problems that may be more effect than cause. So this is our therapeutic strategy. Simply summarizing it, we believe pain gen ALS genetic targeting of metabolic control and the systems we have discussed could risk very harmful side effects. And we do not need to shut down these targets systemically and completely. If I look at comparing some other therapeutic areas, you have to choose kinase cancer, uh, uh, kinases for cancer therapy or antiviral targets and lock them down completely. Five orders of magnitude uh, reduction of activity and you may still not have a tight enough. But in other areas like cystic fibrosis, sometimes just a partial restoration of a normal function is sufficient to give a very robust therapy. And that's more the picture that we envisage with what I've described here. We believe small molecule drugs offer a safer and more tractable approach and that this vital metabolic regulation system we've identified is eminently druggable for reasons I haven't had time to go into. But thank you all for your time. I hope this stimulates some more thought and interest and uh, happy to answer a few questions if, if we've got time.
I Thank got you, John. Um, I will happily take some questions from the chat, but uh, in the meantime, I guess I would start. Um, you had a nice analogy um, in, in describing the thermostat being broken. I guess I would ask, um, how certain can we be that the thermostat is broken rather than the temperature is still cold, right? So, so that the stress there is such that that stress response persists um, because it, it needs to rather than that um, fundamental piece of, of the process being broken? So, so, so that's a great question. I refer to one of the curiosities and that, that I mentioned briefly, and that was that this all happens when the cells are just pumping out ATP and they're surrounded by what they think they're starved of. So that's the first clue that there's something wrong. Uh, now, something wrong can be on two sides of the coin. It can be on the sensing side or it can be on the response side. And I think that adds a new doubling of dimensionality or opportunity in this system. It can be a phantom um, stress state, a phantom, phantom starvation, or it can be the real thing. It doesn't really matter. It can be the sensing has gone wrong or mobilizing the right cellular machinery to then turn on and turn off the right uh, backup uh, energy sources can be a response misfunction. So um, that's where the next part of the story starts, most definitely. But we already have hints that that it really is more about that, uh, that there is something wrong, that these are not chronically starving. And if you look like look at a, an ALS patient, th these patients are generally not chronically starving of, uh, uh, in a dietary sense or systemically starving. This is a more subtle effect of starvation or localized uh, molecular stress, molecular starvation that we must tease out a little more. Sure, thank you. Um, a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, we'll take two quickly. Um, I, I, one uh, straightforward question. What is the current status on small molecule therapy candidates um, in your program um, in their evaluation? We have identified, uh, we, we, we are looking for financing to do all of this right, but that's not the subject of today. To, to, to uh, talk about the molecules that we've already looked at they range from drugs that we really believe have the right therapeutic index and the right mechanistic um, understanding to be a real chance of uh, working here, repurposing for um, ALS, to advanced uh, chemical leads from um, preclinical phase work to very early leads in uh, new, brand new classes of chemistry. Um, we don't have time to talk about where we are with that, but we're, we're right at the beginning in terms of, uh, of doing this uh, evaluation of uh, chemical space the right way and uh, hope to get some partners soon. Okay. And I'll, I'll go ahead with one more uh, question um, from Dr. Robert Brown. Uh, can you provide more specific insight into the pathology of the ALS stress granules? Are the dynamic of for formation and degradation abnormal? Dynamics. Um, is the interaction with mitochondria disturbed? Other pathologies? Oh, um, it, it's uh, a, a very deep question. Um, the connections to other pathologies are... Um, not directly translatable to what we uh, yet see here in our own studies of ALS. But I would generally defer that question to my partner and the uh, um, seminal scientist all, in all of this, uh, Dan Kaganovich, um, and leave well, it at that. <laughs> all right. Well, we, we, will, um, we do have to move on uh, to our next presentation. But thank you very much, John, for a great presentation. Enjoyed it very much. Um,